asked me to, uh, how did I get in this program? Mm -hmm. So I walked all the way through, and then they said, well, what jobs did you handle for 120 days? And on the 121st day, we had to take the test, how to assemble and disassemble the Mark mm -hmm. 5, the Mark 6, and the Mark 7. This is one job. You do not make a mistake. Yeah. I would say so. <laughs> I can remember that just as clear as day. <laughs> My name is Joseph Kent, uh, J-O-S-E-P-H-K-E-N-T, and I'm, uh, we're going to be doing an oral history interview with Ernest Williams on October 28th, 2019 at the National Atomic Testing Museum in the second floor conference room. Ernie, uh, Ernie can you please state your first and last name and spell them for us and give your birth date? Ernest B. Williams, born December 20, 1930, E-R-N-E-S-T. B like in boy, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you again for agreeing to do the oral his history interview with us here at the museum. We appreciate it. Um, I first want to ask, um, just to start us off, did you ever serve in the military? And if so, when and where? Yes. The answer is yes. I uh, got my draft notice in December 1954. I enlisted in the United States Air Force and. January 10, 1951, and I served three years in the nuclear field. Uh, I went to school at Albuquerque, New Mexico uh, to um, learn how to assemble and disassemble nuclear weapons. I worked uh, 120 days, 12 hours a day, six days a week, and uh, at the end of 120 days we had a, a a, t a test, you had to score 92 and above, and basically it was assembly and disassembly nuclear weapons. And so um, I answered all the questions without too much of a problem. And um, then you had to do a lot of it blindfolded. And you had to assemble it and disassemble it. Uh, naturally, we were, the core was not the real thing, but it was exactly what we would be working with. And uh, I worked with that. <clears throat> I graduated with 92. Uh, immediately I was uh, assigned to the 1st Tactical Support Squadron. I went up to uh, an area on Sandia Base, uh, which is basically all underground, and um, I would uh, be a security guard. And I was security guard for almost six months at uh, Monsanto, uh, basically probably close to two miles underground. And uh, I never really assembled nuclear devices there. I basically worked as a security guard because we relieved the Army 50% of their people so they could take annual leave and we could take care of our, you know, replace them. So I worked there for about six months. In February of 1952, I went to Langley Air Force Base. We took six live units with us. And then about 14 or 15 days later, we left uh, Hampton, uh, New Jersey. Or I, maybe it's Virginia, I don't know. Anyway, we left aboard ship the USS Hahn, and uh, we guarded our units all the way across the ocean. And we arrived at Southampton, uh, uh, England, uh, about one o'clock in the morning. We unloaded all of our tractors and we unloaded our 48-foot floats, and we brought down the first nuclear device, put it on the float. We were very gently told that we could not have weapons over in Great Britain. You could not have a weapon. So, Major uh, Davies was a a gentleman that had been in World War II as an enlisted man, he got a battlefield commission and he was now a major, great guy to work for. And uh, he said, Ernie, what do we do? And I said, we're going back aboard ship, we're going to get rid of the M1s, we're going to unblouse our fatigues, and we're putting 245s in our boots and we're coming back down. <laughs> <laughs> And the British never knew we had weapons. Yeah. 
So then the Major Davies said to me, he said, the, the gentleman on the first truck is sick. He said, I know you're a farm boy from Nebraska. He said, can you drive that tractor? And I said, yeah, I can drive that tractor. Then I no more said that, then all of a sudden it realized, hey, we drive on the left-hand side of the road over here. The streets are very narrow. And so I was the lead man for the five more trucks behind me. I have to tell you, some of the streets were very narrow. The left-hand side of the truck was up on the, cur up on the sidewalk, just about to hit the building, and the tail end was up on the sidewalk about to hit the building, and that's how we got around the corners, very gently. And I looked at the Bobby and I said, I don't care what you do, if we have to travel another 50 miles or 100 miles, we're not going to be on any narrow streets anymore. <laughs> and so I spent uh, three or four months uh, involved in assembly and disassembling nuclear weapons. Then I was asked, would I take over the badge office? And so I took over the badge office, and um, very unique in those days because as after you got the picture and after you got the, the plastic thing, it had gold bands across, and up that went over the top of your picture. Mm -hmm. And so it could never be duplicated. It was a gold braid. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I did that for probably seven or eight months. <clears throat> but in January 31, 1953, uh, a town uh, about 50 miles from us, uh, right on the North Sea, and uh, they, the waters came over the dikes. The dikes wouldn't, or I should say earthen dikes were probably 12 to 14 feet in height. The ocean came over the top of that and flooded the whole town. So 60 of us volunteered, and we went over there to help get people in boats and get them out of their houses. And um, we spent uh, a total of 36 hours without going to bed. It's in February, and the water's cold. It's the only time I ever saw a Protestant chapel and pour some other than just water. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, and then I, I went back to the base as in charge of the badge office. I continued to do that until I was uh, eligible to come home after 18 months, and I was shipped to, to Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, and I arrived at Nellis Air Force Base, and uh, I said, where's, where's the assembly and disassembly area? And said, we don't have one. So I had to change my field. There happened to be a young man in the Air Force that decided he could build, or I mean, he could sign and cash U.S., other people's U.S. savings bonds. Mm. Well, we know where he went. And so I was told I had to take over 600, uh, payment of 600 officers every 30 days for a year. And I did that very successfully. Uh, it was a, a little bit of a problem trying to get him up uh, from because Colonel Jones wanted to make sure they had enough flying time so they could be fighter pilots in in the Korean War, and I started. I I could never get all of them up for three days before they leave because that's the requirement I had to uh, get to the finance office to pay them. And I, I went down to see Colonel Jones and I said, Jones, I'm having a real tough time getting their people up here, and he said. You just give me a list of when you want them, and I'll see that they get there. <laughs> and so uh, I got discharged on January the 10th, 1955. I went down on 1235 South Main Street and uh, walked in with uniform like I am today. And I said, I understand you're hiring people to be federal employees. And she said, yes, but you have to have a special clearance. And I said, I can handle that. Don't worry about it. And she said, no, I don't think you understand. You have to be investigated by the FBI. And I said, well, look, ma'am, I'm 28 eight years or 24 years old. Uh, I've had a Q clearance since 1951. And she just stopped. And she picked up the phone. I had no idea who she was talking to. 
And he come around to coffee and he said, I'm Mr. Jack Coffee. He said, I understand you have a Q clearance. I said, yes, I do. And he said, you're hired. That's how I got hired in the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we, we get going to how you got involved in the Nevada test site and all of that, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about the the weapons that you were assembling and disassembling the nuclear weapons. So uh, I believe before you had said it was the Mark 5, 6, and 7. That's correct. Could you kind of get into a little bit of what was different about those and how they differed maybe from earlier models? Uh, there's not a lot of difference between the 5, 6, and 7 uh, Mark uh, nuclear devices. Uh, we, we First of all, we went to school to understand all of the elements that's involved in a nuclear device and what you'd have a problem if you mixed them and certain things and you blow up the whole facility. And so, um, yeah, we went through all of that. Uh, we st studied various elements of the nuclear device. Uh, I'm not at liberty to go into a lot of details of that, but, um, you know, we had certain sections of the nuclear device that we all had to work on and learn all about it. And uh, then, then we, uh, towards the last, we were instructed how we were going to put the probe into the nuclear device to make it active. Now, you got to remember the probe that we were working with was not the real probe. It was a wooden, uh, I want to call it a stick, that we would induce into it. And so, uh, but we had to do all of that blindfolded. Now there are five wires on this side and there are five wires on this side. And each wire, as you well know, you know has a male and a female like you have in an automobile. But each one of the male and females are different. The second set's different. The third side's different. The fourth side's different. The fifth one is. So you, and they scramble up all the wires for you. And so you feel them blindfolded, and it took me two hours to make ten, ten different connections. And I made sure that uh, the male and the female, and you have to feel them pretty closely because if you don't, and a lot of people didn't do it, and they just bombed out. And you put them together. Now if you miss and misconstrue one of them, the red light was gone and you flunked the course. And so, it, as I say, it took me about two hours to put ten different connections together. But eventually I scored 92 and you have to score, I scored 95 and you have to score 92. And I was out of 100, there was only 33 of us that made it. Okay, thank you. And then, so, let's look into uh, your time at the Nevada test site, what you first started doing. I know you were getting ready to talk a little bit about that. So let's go back to how you got on board with the Nevada test site and, and some stories there. Well, I, you know, I hired in with the federal government in January 17, 1955. Uh, I went to the test site. I went to work for Jack Coffee, uh, working feeding, housing, maintenance of roads, maintenance of buildings, some construction and some engineering. And, um, but Jack asked me if I would do feeding, housing, and maintenance of roads. And I said, sure, I can do that. And, uh, you know, some, I want to say towards the middle of February, uh, we did the first uh, nuclear test at, uh, in Frenchman Flat. And about six and a half miles on the south end, up on the, up on the upper wind, not the downwind side. And uh, Jack said, well, you're going to witness your first uh, nuclear device. And I have to pan. It was about 40 degrees that morning. You know, I had a jacket on. And I saw the fireball. You know, got dented the fireball, and there's a huge, bright white light. You got four port, two density goggles on, and you can see that fireball. And then you you can take them off, and then you see the fireball starting to rise. And Jack looked over and he said, what's wrong with you? The sweat beads are just rolling off of me. And I said, yeah, I knew they were awesome, but I didn't realize how awesome they were. And he said, you're broken in a dead sweat. And I said, yeah. 
And that's the first time that Jack realized that I had been in assembly and disassembly of nuclear weapons. And I said, I never knew that they were so awesome. And, you know, and I was aware that we'd used two in Japan and we'd been at Atawitok in 1946 and 1948 or 40, early 49. And then the test site got created in uh, January of 51. I actually, a letter was signed by Truman in, uh, my memory served me, December the 18th, 1949. Uh, uh, I have to stop and think. 1950, uh, because the test site didn't come together until 51. And it, it was a great program, I have to admit. Uh, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was in feeding and housing and maintenance of roads and maintenance. I did 14 atmospheric shots at the test site in Operation Teapot. And uh, at the end of the season, I was a temporary employee at the time. And uh, so some, early September, they said, uh, Jim Reeves told me, he said, and he's the test manager and the only man that could authorize a detonation of a nuclear device. Come in and he said, Ernie, we're going to have to let you go. And I said, but he said, the alternative is, I know you're a good typist. There's a lady in Albuquerque in the finance division that is typing up the CR9 report. Now, the CR9 report is 27 columns of figures and the, the title of it is over on the left-hand side. So it was ditto. And you unfolded the papers and you... And I did the first one in ditto because the lady had went on maternity leave. And I tell you, my white shirt was just purple, you know. And I looked at uh, Frank Abbott and I said, Frank, aren't you aware of Maltolith? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, wait a minute. We are in the field with Maltolith, and you don't have Maltolith in the operations office? He said, no, we don't. I said, tell you what, I'm going downtown Saturday. Monday morning, I will give you a name, and you need to get the guy through the gate, and we're going to talk about Maltolith. And so the representative came in from the printing company, and. He uh, explained a little bit, and if you, I don't know whether you remember or not, it was a multilith sheet about so long, and it was about so wide, and you could type on it, just like putting paper in your room or type, but you have a special rubber eraser that you can make the change. And uh, so I put that all together, and uh, uh, it was probably on an average of, as I remember, six or ten pages. And uh, that was the total cost of all of the nuclear devices that was in the stockpile. Now, I don't know how many that was, but I, I can tell you how many billions of dollars it was. And uh, so, you know, I got the next one printed in, in Multilith, and he looked at it and he said, my, this is like a book. I can read it. And I said, yeah, beats that Multilith, doesn't it? Well, I walked into an office of people in the finance division at uh, general ledger section, they'd been there 10, 15, and 20 years and they never had an award. And shortly after I was hired and changed it all into Maltolith, uh, in the month of November I was called to the f finance office and all the employees of the finance office came in and he said, we're going to award this young man $250 award for getting a Maltolith. Well, I wasn't too well happy, and I was happy, but there was a lot of people that in, had been in the finance division that had never gotten an award. And here is a young punk that comes in and <laughs> gets a reward. <laughs> now, can you go into a little bit about what life was like at Mercury? I know a lot of the people that follow us on our YouTube and through other social media are always interested in knowing what life was like at Mercury and, and some of the things that went on there. So could you kind of yeah. describe that a little bit? Sure. Uh, you know, in Mercury we had, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, probably 20, 21 uh, dormitories. 
But there were seven, or else there were fourteen men to a room. Now the women had seven dormitories, and they had individual rooms, but there were two women to each room. And um, but Jack and I and six other men uh, lived in an eight-man uh, dormitory. Um, there wasn't a lot of privacy to it. Uh, there was one central uh, rest area or, a, or a latrine where you could get a shower and shave and do whatever you need to do. And, um, and the thing that really got my attention was when I first went to the test site is I could, we had two cafeterias and in order to eat at the cafeteria we had a turnstile and you dropped a silver dollar into the turnstile and you ate all you wanted. If you could eat six steaks, you ate six steaks. And, and you know, for a total of a of, uh, dollar a meal. Now you gotta remember, if I take you back to Las Vegas, silver dollars were very prominent in Las Vegas in 53, 54, 55, 56, started phasing out in 57, if you bought something at two dollars, I'll guarantee you, you're going to get 18 silvers back. And what, what, so people would come to the test site. Uh, uh, there was a contractor that, uh, where you could get silver dollars. You put in a twenty dollars and he'd give you his twenty silvers back. And I have to tell you, you know, the people would, cash a $20 bill and they'd get 20 silvers and they spent three of them at the test site and they lost the other 17 in town and they're back the next morning wanting to know if they can't cash a $20 bill. I had a heck of a problem trying to keep silver dollars. I would get $10,000 worth of silver dollars from downtown and two or three days later I had to have another run because people lost the other 17 downtown. And we had a lot of slot machines in town. Uh, we didn't have all the motel or ho major casinos today. In those days we had only, we had uh, Flamingo, well let's start with the Sahara first. Then we had one across the street which burned down in 62. Then we had the uh, uh, Sahara, uh, let's see, then we went to Frontier, we had the Desert Inn, and the Flamingo, and that was it. And then you had the downtown uh, Fremont area. And the Golden Nugget uh, was pretty popular. You know, I won't say that the rest of them wasn't popular, um, but a lot of people was in the Golden Nugget. I established uh, at the Golden Nugget after I uh, signed up a bunch of papers, and I then they went back to Nebraska and checked my bank account, because I didn't do business in town, I still did business in the bank in Nebraska. So I was eligible to, to walk into the casino and to the cage and, and say, I got a $50 check, can you give me cash? And so they would do that. But you had to be checked out before they'd allow you to do that. But, uh, you know, I could cash uh, two checks a, a week if I needed to do that. And the average, I didn't do that because Staying at the test site was a dollar a meal and 50 cents a night. Now you got to remember when I come out of the service, you see my uniform with f four stripes on it. There were only six stripes in my day. I was only making $128 a month. And I said, hey, you know, um, I, I recognized that government was furnishing me board and room and laundry, but the food was not good at Nellis. And so, you have to remember, we go back to 1954, the Korean War was just starting. MacArthur had went in and started the war, at the beginning of the war. Well, late 1954 and early 1955, there was a lot of influx, and I'm one of them. I didn't want to be drafted, so I enlisted. And, you know, uh, that went on for all those years. Well, late 1954 and early 55, there's such an outflux coming out of the Air Force. And they're wanting to know why you won't re-enlist, because they're, they're short of manpower. And so you had to, had to meet with General Stevenson at Nellis Air Force Base 
why you wouldn't re-enlist. Well, it come my turn to go up, and I was in uniform, saluted him, and said, good morning, and, and uh, General Stevens, and he said, well, I want to know why you won't re-enlist. And I said, well, I don't like to work for people that won't do something for themselves. I said, I don't mind working for people, but I'd like to believe that they would work in that same field. And I said, I've had some people that I had to work for had never been in the field, and they were never going to go in the field, but they wanted you to do the work. I don't buy that. And I said, secondly, I said, I don't want to, I don't want to disturb you. I'm a typical farm boy out in Nebraska, and I'm going to tell you, we get, my old man feeds slop to his hogs better than what we get here. And he stood up and he said, you're kidding. I said, no. Why don't you do me a favor? Leave them two stars off, and I'll pick you up in the morning at 6 o'clock. We're going to an enlisted man's mess. Don't you put them two stars on till we're about ready to pick up the this, this steel tray. And he did exactly what I wanted. I got to tell you, the eggs were so runny you could hardly keep them on a steel tray. The, the hash browns were burnt black. The toast was black. The bacon was, if you hit it with a hammer, you had 80,000 pieces. And we walked over to the table with that steel tray, and the eggs were just so runny. And he said, don't look good, does it? And I, he went back to the garbage can, and he dumped his, and I dumped mine. And he came back to the table with uh, a spoon and uh, a box of milk and a post toasties box. And, and a spoon and a bowl, and I'm not going to say the exact word here, but he said, I wonder if they effed this up too. <laughs> and he said, now, what you, I want you to come to my office at 10 o'clock. I said, I'll be there, sir. I want you to tell me, what do we got to do to correct this? I said, well, you've got people that's in the feeding and business that should know what to do. And he said, no, I want to hear it from you. I said, well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is you have a contractor at Nellis. He needs to go downtown and hire professional cooks. I want you to take half the staff at the cafeteria and get rid of them. Keep the good ones, get rid of the rest. Let the civilians come in through your contractor and teach these young men how to cook. I said, I recognize you got to have service people in uniform on the front line. I understand that. But every base doesn't have to have that. And so he, uh, we, he said, look, uh, but if we get good food, he said, will you re-enlist? I said, no, I'm not re-enlisted. I said, I've already been hired by the Atomic Energy Commission. Oh, nuclear testing. And I said, yeah, that's where I'm getting into. He, I didn't tell him I was in the nuclear field yet. And uh, he said, well, do you know your phone number? And I said, yeah, I know my phone number. Well, give it to me. I'm going to call you when I get good food here. And he said, I'm going to call you and let you know we got good food, and I want you to come to town. So, you know, so I got discharged on the 10th of January, and... and um, Almost to the end of February, which has 28 days, about the 27th day, phone rang. Well, Jack Coffey and I sat in an office with the desks up against the walls, and our two chairs was in the middle. And the phone rang, and Jack Coffey, he answered it, and then he put his hand over the mouthpiece, and he said, some general wants to talk to you. <laughs> and I said, okay, fine. Well, I came on the line, and I said, this is Ernie Williams. And he said, well, this is General Stevenson. What are you doing tomorrow morning? I said, oh, what do you got on mind? And he said, well, I want you to come in, meet me at the house at 6 o'clock, and we're going to lunch, or we're going to breakfast. Got to tell you, we had eggs over easy. We had nice uh, potatoes that were, you know, brown. They were in good shape. You know, the coffee was good. I'm not a big coffee drinker, but it was good coffee. And, um, you know, we had good toast, 
And uh, he said, I want you to come to my office as soon as I'm done. And he said, uh, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay, I'll be up there. What time do you want me there? He said, well, 8 o'clock would be fine. And I walked in his office and I saluted him, even though I was a civilian. And he said, I want to know if you'd re-enlist. And I said, no, I'm not going to re-enlist. And he said, well, I want, to, I want to thank you for your effort because he said, we now have good food for the enlisted people. And so then I, I went back to the test site. I continued on in the nuclear testing in Operation Teapot. We had 14 atmospheric shots. Over a period of time at the Nevada test site, uh, they ranged from one kiloton and Frenchman Flat up to 37 kilotons and in Yucca Flats from one kiloton to 74 kilotons. You can't fire much bigger than that because you're not far away enough distance between Las Vegas and, and, and the test site. And, uh, you know, I, I finished up Operation Tent Pie. Uh, 14 atmospheric shots. And then Jim Reeves, uh, after I was in finance, he come to me and he said, I need a new administrative officer at the test site. Or, I mean, beg your pardon, at Anna Weetok. And I said, okay. Uh, and he said, well, you know, you're, you're going to be out there on an island all by yourself. And I said, yeah, there's probably, I won't be the only one. And so I went through Operation Red Wing. Now, now, if I can back up for a second, what was your role uh, during Operation Teapot? My role was feeding, housing, uh, maintenance of roads, and making sure that we had hot meals at midnight out in the field. Mm -hmm. okay. And it was very important because, first of all, I talked to, to Jack Coffey and I said, don't we have a hot wagon? And he said, no, we don't have one. Well, you need to get one bought, and we're going to serve the people working at midnight. We're going to serve them a hot meal. They're only getting cold sandwiches now. It's very important that we get hot meals out there at midnight. So, but in shortly after, we got another what I call a hot wagon, and so we could serve hot meals out at midnight because the people are working, trying to put things together, the electronics and getting it installed, uh, making sure that they do dry runs onto it. That all has to go back to the control point, which is anywhere from 10 miles to 20 miles. And we do about 19 dry runs before we arm electronically the nuclear device. Uh, I can't say in early in the game got to remember, I wasn't at the test site from 51 to 54, so they may have armed some of those by hand. Um, but modernization had came along, and you could do this electronically now. And so, uh, you know, uh, between the Nevada test site, Anahuitoc, and Bikini Atoll, which is 2,500 miles west of Honolulu, and Christmas Island is 1,200 miles south of Honolulu, which is a British island. And between those four islands, and there are four places, I've been through 80 atmospheric shots. The largest I've ever attended is 10.9 megatons on the average a mile and a half away. Guarantee you, you ain't got down, stooped over a little bit and your hands down on your knees, you're going down. <laughs> The shockwave is going to get you. The question is, is about uh, Camp Desert Rock. Uh, Camp Desert Rock was established by the engineering uh, uh, of uh, the military. I think it was Army, and they built the camp. Uh, they had troops in, in 1951, 52, 53, 51, 52. Probably uh, 53 and then 54, we didn't have any tests at the test site. So 55 was at the test site. When I came to the test site in 55, we had 9,000 soldiers in Camp Desert Rock. Now, you just barely turn off the highway. You probably travel in a mile and a half, two miles, and there's a road to the left. And Camp Desert Rock was had a number of permanent buildings and then a whole lot of tents. And there were 
eight men or fourteen men to a tent. And in February 1955, it got down to 20 degrees uh, for three nights. Those poor soldiers didn't even have a pot belly stove down in their, in their tents. It couldn't have been the most comfortable place to be. Uh, but then they would get in trucks. Uh, uh, we normally fired at 4.30 in the morning because we take photography and that's how we measured shockwave. We didn't know how to measure shockwave only by photography. Edgerton, Germerhout, and Greer were three men that really understood ph photography. Um, they produced a camera that would shoot 20,000 frames a minute. And afterwards, we could take that and measure, you know, how long, put a minute onto it, and you knew how quickly shockwave was driven. That's how we measured shockwave, how many pounds per square inch was coming out of this thing. And uh, we didn't know how to do that, only by photography. And, uh, uh, but I have to admit, uh, the soldiers that I saw at Camp Desert Rock, uh, the first time I saw them going out, I looked at Jack Coffey and I looked at Jim Reeves, which was the test manager. You gotta remember now, Jim Reeves, Jack Coffey, and I all come from the Corps of Engineers out of Omaha. There's a little bit of fraternity Fraditation there, you know, we, we kind of take care of each other. And uh, I said to Jim, what are you doing with the troops on the downwind side? My God, there's a lot of radiation down there. And Jim looked at me and he said, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. How do you know anything about it? And I said, Jim, you didn't ever ask me. I've been in assembling, disassembling nuclear weapons. And he just stood up, took a double look at me and he said, you're much sharper than I thought you were. And I said, well, you know, radiation content. These guys are going to get radiation. Even though they're in the trench and they're stooped over, but the back of their necks are not protected. I said, they're going to get, they're going to get some radiation out. And I said, secondly, uh, why are we doing this? He said, look, Ernie, I've been to Washington, D.C. I've met before Congress. And he said, I objected to them being on the downwind side. But the Department of Defense and the Secretary of State overruled me, and so I said to Congress, and it's on record, that any problems with me uh, medical help, and because they got cancer, that lawsuit is against the DOD, not the AEC. That still stands yet today. And it was, to me, it was very important, you know. Uh, it's, it's so sad that, I, you know, I know a lot of people probably had a miserable life, uh, suffered some. Just so happens that uh, the lady I'm married to now, uh, her husband died being in the trenches in 1951 and 53, and he died of melanoma on his neck. So sad that the DOD didn't understand that they didn't need to have these troops. They could have got lots of experience of being on the upwind side as well as being on the downwind side. But, you know, I have no doubt in my mind there's a lot of soldiers that didn't have a very comfortable life years later. Probably didn't show up until they were 20, 30, 40 years later. And, uh, you know, it's. It's sad that it happened, but um, that was a decision made by major people in Washington, D.C. And uh, I don't know of anybody in the AEC except myself. I volunteered, I talked to Jim Reeves, and I said, I want to be in the trench on the upwind side on a 23 kiloton shot. I want to be in the trench at a mile and a quarter. And he said, Ernie, I, I can't direct you to do that. And I said, I know that. I'm volunteering. May I have your permission? I want to know what it is to be in the trench when I hear the soldier saying, this is the kind of shockwave we got. I said, I want to confirm that. He said, OK. Place your dosimeter over there, and you can do that over there. <laughs> 
A dosimeter, as you well know, it, uh, measures how much radiation content you get. And so uh, I sat in the, uh, went to the trench on a 23 kiloton shot, atmospherically, on a tower. And I have to admit, at a uh, mile and a quarter away, yeah, the shock wave. I was up to my shoulders in the trench, just laid me up against that wall of the trench for about 10 or 12 seconds. I couldn't move, boy. I mean, the shock wave just laid me up against the wall. But I have to be honest with you, I, I'd do it again tomorrow, you know. Well, let, let's shift gears to your time in, um, and we talk, I told you, you were talking about how you went out there yeah. a little bit afterwards, and I'd like to, um, if you could kind sure. of uh, be glad that. Yeah, and we talk is uh, 2,500 miles west of Honolulu, it's in the Marshall Islands. We have uh, Anawitok and Bikini Atoll, and they're about 200 miles apart. The first test was uh, in 1946, after World War II in Japan, and um, they uh, were on Bikini Atoll. They moved all the natives off from Anawitok and Bikini Atoll and took them down to Rongulap, which is about 200 miles away southeast of us. And, and everything went fine, you know, they had the tests in 1946, 47, 48. I don't think there was any tests in 49. And, um, and then the Nevada. The laboratories kept saying to the AEC, which basically would be Jim Reeves, and we need to get data and we need to do the smaller stuff on the continental limits of the United States. Then we'll transfer that into the larger role and do the big stuff out at Anawetok, because there's not enough room to do more than about 75 uh, kilotons at the test site, atmospherically. And if you do, you're going to rock some buildings downtown. And all the buildings had uh, uh, motion detectors on them anyways. We had every building then. But you got to remember, Vegas only had six stories in those days. If you was to ask me today, uh, no, I wouldn't want to do that. But let's. Uh, Anawetok, um, on the island of uh, Anawetok, we're about three and a half miles from Fred, we called Elmer and Fred. Fred happened to be the military base that had the runway onto it and that's where the airplane would land. We flew most of the time in military airplanes out from Honolulu to Anawetok. And, uh, the military had uh, dormitories a little bit better than we did. We had dormitories, but they were made of like a butler, metal, but, uh, metal butler building. Uh, there were no doors on the, wind, on the doors. There were no windows. There were just flaps. It's 72 degrees most every day, and, and you have a six-foot partition between your room, and, and there's no doors on your room. There's a community restroom, and there would be 10 or 12 of us into a building. Uh, I happened to be in the AEC quarters, so we only had about 10 of us. Uh, and it was great. Uh, it, let me see, we paid $3.50 a day. And that included uh, our three meals and uh, laundry. And uh, if you wanted anything else, you had to pay it out of your own pocket. You know. But it was a convenient area for me. I, I have to admit, when I was first in the service, yeah, I had $4,000 in the bank. But I had the opportunity when I was in Europe that I could go to other countries, you know, Wiesbaden, Italy, Rome, Florence, Italy, Spain, Netherlands, Switzerland. I had a pilot that was from Nebraska, and a pilot has to get 12 hours of flying time every three months. He'd say, Ernie, I'm going to so-and-so, or, or where would you like to go? I'll drop you off, and three days later, I'll, back, I'll be back and pick you up. Well, what a, what a joy that was to me, because didn't cost me anything for flying. All it cost me was my room and board while I was gone. And so 
Uh, yeah, I have to admit, I spent quite a bit of money over in Europe. But I got to see a lot of country. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what are the main ways that the Nevada test site and the Pacific Proving Ground were different as far as the experience you had out there? Uh, at the Nevada test site, the experience that I would tell you about is we're only going to fire up to 74 kilotons at the test site because you, you can't do much more than that, you know. And so, and we talk, uh, yeah, we can fire up to uh, 15 megatons. As you well know, Baker shot was in February 1954, and uh, Dr. Teller thought he'd put fission and fusion together, and uh, he thought it would be 8.8 .8 megatons, and they went 15. Well, that's the largest we've ever fired nationwide in the United States. But it vaporized a whole island. There's no island left. Now, I wasn't there when that happened. I had the privilege of working in, in 1957 and a helicopter looking down onto it and the, and the crater is 6,020 feet wide and it vaporized the reef 240 feet deep. There is no rock. That's a lot of heat that None of us really understand how much heat coming from this thing. Uh, I will tell you that uh, on the average between six and ten miles, you better be down with your hands on your knees, uh, or otherwise you're going down. And at Anna We Talk, we did a lot of um, towers, steel towers. Uh, at Christmas Island, everything was an airdrop. We didn't have any. The thing at Christmas Island was is that, you know, I'd been in Great Britain. I knew that electricity was 50 cycle and, and 100, 220. It didn't dawn on me when Jim Rees asked me to go to Christmas Island and I left within a couple of days. And uh, I no more, I got on the Hastings, which is a British plane in Honolulu and flew down to, to uh, Christmas Island. It took about seven hours. And I no more than landed. I looking out the little window, and here's all. The, it's a big event for the natives. They want to see that airplane coming in, and they're just. just that's a big event for them. Well, as I'm looking out the windows, I uh, I really got shocked a little bit because I knew out in the Pacific there are certain islands. Unfortunately, the ladies don't. They don't dress above the waist. And so I looking out the little window and I said, oh, you know, I didn't expect this. There were about uh, 40 British people on the island. And so I landed and I got out and I talked to the, to the I got introduced to the military man from Great Britain. And, uh, and then I got introduced to a couple of other, well, one of the native men could speak English. And he did a nice job of speaking English. And I said to him, and him and the pilot, I said, look, Mr. Pilot, you're going back to Honolulu tonight. I want you to get Pat Ryan out of bed. Here's his phone number. I want him to get into J.C. Penney's. I don't care if it's 4 o'clock in the damn morning. Pardon my French. And I want 100 blouses, large, medium, and small. And he said, you're kidding. I said, no. I can't afford to have tests down here and 3,000 people the way it is. And I said, and if you don't have 100 blouses on board on that plane tomorrow morning to come back down here, don't even crank up the propellers. I said, because I need them really bad. Well, I got to be honest with you, you know. When I got the natives, we, I gave them to the young man that could speak English. And I said, here they are, you know, medium, you know, large, medium, and small. But the thing I learned from the native, he said, the native women have never had a brand spanking new piece of clothing. And as I would walk down through the, the, the uh, I want to say the uh, people from, that was on the island, the natives, they realized that I was the one, and some of them could speak English, and they'd say, Thank you, I got a new blouse. What a, what a joy that was that they 
received a, a nice new piece of, of clothing that they'd never had before. Well, at, at Christmas Island, uh, it was very reasonable. Uh, we spent, uh, my memory serves me, we paid $3 a day for our room and our board and our eats and, uh, and our laundry. So I was able, to, as, as a single man, I was able to pocket a few dollars because I wasn't spending anything, you know. And I was getting, at the test site, I was getting, uh, uh, I, I had to be at the test site in 19, hmm, I have to stop and think about this, 63? Yeah, 63 to 65. All the contractor people got seven and a half or five dollars a day, but the feds didn't get anything. So Dick Richard Hamlin and I started saying, "Hey, we need to get a hold of Congress." We also knew that off the offshores of California, they're getting subsistence of seven and a half a day for working on the islands outside the coastline of the United States. So we started. Our, Dick Hamlin says, well, I can't type. And I said, well, I can type. So we, between him and I, we wrote 100 letters to senators and we followed 520 House representatives. He signed a lot of them and I signed a lot of them. Well, it took us two and a half years to finally get the federal government and a, and a bill through Congress, through Senate, and signed by the president. And we started in 1966 getting uh, $5 in mercury and seven and a half if you reported beyond. Now, how long did you work for the Atomic Energy Commission? The Atomic Energy Commission, I worked for 37 and a half years. Uh, I took a year off. I retired in August of uh, 1 of 1986 with 37 and a half years of federal service, including my four years of military. And I, re and then I, Dale Fraser come and got me and uh, said I needed to report over to Dick Land's office. Tom Clark was the manager of Nevada Operations Office and had called me and said, Dale Fraser's going to come and get you. He, and he said, I want you to hire in because I was, to me, I was the budget officer, but to you, it's probably more comptroller. And so um, I went into the office in 1983 as a comptroller. I did that for three years. Um, no disrespect, Linda Smith, personnel manager, came in and said, we have to demote you by one grade. And I said, no, it's not going to happen. And I said, uh, and she said, well, we got to issue that on, on Monday. So Friday at 3 o'clock, I said, sign Aura. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Tom okay. Clark called me on Saturday, and he said, we don't have anybody to f fill your shoes. You're going to be hired by Rico the, tomorrow morning, or Monday morning, and you're coming back. You're going to be working for Dick Land, but you're coming back. And I said, I'm, I'm willing to do that, but I only report to you because uh, the director that I worked for, uh, he and I didn't see eye to eye. Go ahead. I was going to see if you could go into, um, uh, going back to Mercury, um, you were involved in the origins of the Mercury Steakhouse, weren't you? I sure was. Uh, you know, would you like to go into depth <laughs> on that? I know that's kind of popular well, with the staff. Let's and talk about the, uh, we had a lot of people going down, which is probably 16, 17 miles to Cactus Springs. And the lady at, uh, at Cactus Springs, she had a nice steakhouse and she really served, and it was pretty reasonable. But unfortunately, people would get too much out of the belt and then on the way back to Tessite, they'd have an accident. And I said to Jack Coffey in 57, when I was I was back from out of Weetalk, and, uh, um, and I said, Plum Bob, and I said, Jack, we need, we need to stop this. He said, well, what do you suggest? And I said, well, it's going to... There are two cafeterias at the test site, one building 110 and 112. 
I said, on the 112, on the west end of the cafeteria, we're going to put a steakhouse in. And he said, you're kidding. And I said, no. That will stop the people from going down to Cactus Springs and coming back with jiggle, giggle juice in their stomachs, and we have an accent. And I said, we can't afford that anymore. Jack says, okay, we'll tell the Olympic Commissary Company that that's what we want to do. So we set it up. And, you know, it was working pretty well. Carl Lyons from Los Alamos National Laboratory came in, and I happened to be in the steakhouse that evening. And uh, Carl Lyons came in and ordered a T-bone steak. Well, it has a wooden tray and a metal platter onto it, and it's good and hot. And he cuts in it with his knife, and he realizes that it ain't quite like he wants it. It's not quite done. Well, Carl Lyons would not ask, and I happen to be in the cafeteria at the time, he wouldn't ask the waiter, could you take it back and cook it? No, he grabs all the toothpicks off that table, props it all up with a with toothpicks. Then he takes some toothpicks, takes out his zipper lighter and pours a little liquid onto them and sticks it underneath and sets it on fire on the god on the table. <laughs> I said, Carl, you know, I knew Carl and he knew who I was. I said, Carl, why didn't you just ask us to Nope, I'll cook it to suit myself. <laughs> But the steakhouse was very well attended by a lot of people. It really was. And then in 1963, 64 era, we got a new cafeteria, which I think you've been to test site. Uh, the cafeteria that we have currently today. And eventually we got a steakhouse built in there. I said, because you got to have a steakhouse when we build this building. And so, um, yeah. Uh, that cafeteria has been there since 63. Uh, I sat in a meeting here probably two months ago looking at all the new buildings that's going to be built uh, in 2022. The current cafeteria should be replaced with a brand new one. All of the buildings that were built in 1951, except for one, all of those in Mercury they're now no longer exist. The fire department building uh, has been torn down. There's, of course, we got a new fire department in I don't know, five, six years ago. There are 11 bays in Mercury. I think there's five bays out in the forward area in Yucca. Um, last week, I took a group of people. We stopped at the uh, fire department, and I had tables set up for us. And, Everybody carried their own lunch, and we had lunch there on a tour of the test site. Uh, I have to say the people really enjoyed um, the steakhouse. It got a lot of business, particularly in the test days. And up until 1992, the steakhouse was pretty prominently open at least six or five days a week. And normally it would be closed on, sometimes it would be open on Saturday because a lot of people would say, hey, we got to be here Saturday. So we'd keep it open then. Bill Boris was uh, from Reynolds Electrical Engineering Company in feeding and housing. And Bill and I would talk about various things. Um, by this time, uh, 63, we started the bus system to haul people to the test site. I can remember the first bus we got was an old street, an old city bus that uh, the, and you could, the doors open up about halfway on the bus and it, was, it didn't have enough heat into it and the wind coming in. And, uh, so LTR got, uh, he had a bus company from, uh, I want to say from Phoenix, to Las Vegas, Vegas, to uh, Reno. And, uh, you know, he won the award to start a bus system at the test site. 
and it worked great. You know, we, we finally got people, it was uh, five dollars for tickets. Uh, well, I should say one dollar for tickets, but it was five dollars for the week. And uh, you got, if you worked in Mercury, you got five dollars. If you worked beyond Mercury, you got seven and a half. And in my day working at test site, uh, we, it was a dollar one way and a dollar one way to come home. So it left you, you know, three dollars to, to uh, buy your lunch with. And so it was a very convenient thing to do. Stopped all the uh, cars from going down to Cactus Springs. You got to remember the motor pool <coughs> during the height of all the the testing, we probably had between sedans and pickups, there were 2,500 vehicles. That's a big chore, believe me. And I, I would go to the motor pool and, and say, you know, how's things going? Are we getting cars fixed or, or, or we're having problems getting parts? And, you know, it, it turned out to be okay, you know. We, we probably had a few problems, had, but I never heard much about them, so. Now, uh, what was the last um, test series that you were involved with at the site? I know you had mentioned um, you're there for 37 and a half years. What was the last <coughs> test you were actually involved with? Uh, I want to say August and September of 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one that was scheduled to be shortly after October the 1st, 1992. But George Bush Sr. called the moratorium, and so uh, at, we did the dry runs at uh, between 10 and 12 o'clock at night. Uh, we were ready to bring the nuclear device in at 8 a.m. in the morning, but George Bush called the moratorium at midnight, and so we never got to fire it. Um, and um, one last question um, for anybody who's um, watching these videos that we have on YouTube or um, you know watching your oral history interview, um, what do you hope they get out of it? As far as I watching? personally would like to see the the public to particularly to come to the museum. I think probably one of the most important things in the museum. And there's a lot of good things in the museum, but the the theater to let them know what it is to as realistically as we can to demonstrate what an atmospheric shot is because they are never going to see one and that to me is the highlight of coming to the to, uh, to the museum now don't misunderstand me there's a lot of other stuff to be talked about uh, particularly the tunnels and and the and the canister rack is very important in this in this unit here. People don't realize that the canister rack, going down the hole, on the average could be two two hundred and sixty tons to three hundred and ninety tons. Uh, the canister rack for Los Alamos was built in Los Alamos, and shipped down here. Now that's shipped on trucks. Well, I should say the tractor and a 48-foot float, but the float has got a hydraulic system to it, so it never gets out of balance. It's perfectly level the whole trip. Those two uh, trailers had to be pretty expensive for Los Alamos to buy. <laughs> and but, so, you know, um, but that's the last event that I was involved with. Yeah. Uh, there no. were some events after I retired in 1986 that I did not participate in until 19, uh, May of 1991. That's when I became the senior verification representative between the United States and Russia. And I did that for 15 months. So the last event was in late September 1992. Uh, we would have had one more, which we visit now uh, on the tours of the test site, but we never got it fired. And uh, that was a combination of uh, United States and Great Britain. Okay. And there's probably, on the, my best guess is, probably $53 million and we got the Zippo for it. And uh, I make no bones about it that uh, there's some hard feelings between Great Britain and the United States over that. 
Well, thank you, Ernie, for your time. Um, we really appreciate you coming to the museum and talking with us and telling us a little bit about your story. It's always a pleasure talking with you, and, and thanks again, and I hope you have a wonderful You're day. You're quite welcome.